Uh, my name is Claire Aguilar. I'm the Director of Programming at Sheffield DocFest, and I'd like to welcome you. <laughs> Yay, woohoo! I would like to welcome you to our 2016 edition, our 23rd DocFest. You know, at DocFest we do a lot of planning, and one is, is that we, we go and try to think, well, we'd like to do special uh, retrospectives or tributes to directors, and there are so many great um, directors and film teams in documentary, but we're especially honored this year to invite um, the two masters in documentary, uh, D.A. Pennebaker and Chris Hegedus are with us today. We are going to show their latest film called Unlocking the Cage, that's tomorrow, and we're also showing reprises of two of their classic films, which it, we showed already, but also we have a, a great uh, opportunity to talk with them, and talking with them today is the BBC's film program, uh, Francine Stock, who will be interviewing them today. So I'll leave it to you, enjoy, <laughs> and have a good one. Thank you, Claire, um, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, tremendous, we've got an hour and a quarter in which we're going to see various clips from uh, the work of Penny and Chris, who've been working together for 40 years, but of course, obviously, your career goes back a bit beyond that as well. We're going to be talking about some of the different approaches, um, and I would like to invite you to participate as we go along, and there are a couple of people with roving microphones up there, so um, maybe once, we're, once we've seen the first clip, we'll kind of open it out a bit and uh, make it as much masterclass as we can. So, great, here we are. We're going to start. We're going to see, first of all, Don't Look Back's been showing here, and so we're going to see a little excerpt of, of some Dylan stuff. Just for the context, in terms of you were invited by Bob Dylan's manager to go with him on this tour to Britain. Now, what do you think, why, what, what was the reason? I mean, what, what do you think that they wanted that? Why he that? asked me? Yeah, and, and why particularly that, that kind of close-up approach? Because that wasn't usual in documentary making, particularly at the time. You know, that was the idea of following a musician on tour. That's still quite a new idea at that point in the 60s. I always wondered. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 never, I never really knew. I sort of assumed that he wanted me to make a kind of, since they were doing a concert tour, uh, a, a sort of concert film of sorts, even though I didn't know what that was, uh, because it would help promote other concerts he was going to do. That never seemed to be the problem at all. Or, or it, and about th three days after I'd spent with Dylan in London, uh, I decided to do an entirely different film. So it was, it's kind of, and nobody seemed to care what I did. So it was, <laughs> well, it, it was freedom of the kind that you, as a filmmaker, you greatly desire, but very seldom get. And, I mean, we can talk later about both of you being involved in experimental filmmaking, but one gets the sense with, uh, with Don't Look Back that it is very much an experiment for everybody, that, you know, Dylan is participating in it too because he's interested in, in what this might reveal, and, and everybody seems so open to the camera in the way that perhaps you don't always see these days. I could have had a broom in my hand, as far as he was concerned. <laughs> it, it didn't seem to, uh, nobody seemed to take seriously making a, 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 a person making a film all by themselves. Uh, and, and they still don't, really. Uh, but very few people do that. Uh, so it's, it's not surprising. But eventually, I think, uh, I think this kind of filming will become a language. And people will use it in ways that we now barely understand. Because, it, I mean, it endures as a film. It's quoted all the time. People, you know, use it as the benchmark for yeah. the revealing musical documentary. I mean, did you have a sense as you were filming that this was something extraordinary? Uh, no, you never do. It's just <laughs> today's work. But I did have the feeling, uh, because I was... Uh, Dylan's use of language was so interesting, just the way he threw it out. And it, uh, things like, uh, she's true like ice, like fire, really, really hit me when I, when I heard them. And I, I, I thought, you know, maybe my mission here is to, uh, it's like I'm making a film of somebody who in 50 years, everybody will want to see what they were like. 
so <laughs> in that sense. And it's 50 years, isn't it? Like <laughs> it is 50 years, though, and here we are. So, so in all those, uh, you know, when you're in the dressing room with all the hotel rooms, and I mean, it seems so close. Sometimes if there's, I can think of one particular shot where you've got Dylan at a typewriter and there's Joan Byers playing the guitar behind, and it's sort of beautiful. And Marianne Faithful and Marianne hiding Faith in, in her chair, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so there you have it. There you have the 60s kind of in, in that one shot. And you can see that you're moving and thinking, ah, oh, okay, maybe if I have him in the foreground there. So there's always that sense of how, and of course you weren't to know how famous they were all going to become, but there is always that sense of finding the best possible composition, the most revealing composition? Uh, well, I'd like to think it was composition, but I never thought of myself as a photographer. Okay. Uh, I was a watcher, and I was getting to watch somebody that was interesting to me. The, 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 the determining factor in any scene or filming or, or shot was always uh, if, it was, if I found it interesting. And, and I was... I was given the freedom to do that. Had I been working for a producer, I probably would not have been able. So it, I, I needed to be an unemployed uh, photographer in order to have that freedom, I think. But I always understood that. And is that a principle for the two of you since, that idea of being accountable to yourselves that's always been primary, always been really important? Um, to be a watcher? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we both, you know, are camera people, so, um, you know, we truly are the watchers. Um, you know, a lot of it is is getting a sense of what it's like in that room, and a lot of it is just logistics. You know, you can only sit here or be there, or, you know, that type of thing. So it, it seems like it may be more, you know, planned than it often is. How long, typically, do you think does it take somebody to get to be completely relaxed with the idea of having somebody in the room with them with a camera? Almost immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess it's, it's probably different for different people, but I mean, basically we try not to overshadow our subjects. I mean, we tend not to use lights and big overhead booms and things like that, so that they're the most important thing in the room and it doesn't become about us, it's always about them. And I think, you know, once they realize that and they realize that you respect them, you're not there to, you know, get them doing something, um, you know, they, they take you into their lives. Well, th yeah. that is, that that is not Don't Look Back, but it's, look back. It's, uh, it's, it's more special, made. maybe. It's that's the thing you made, right? Yeah, it's it's a little cool. footage that I put together on a reel that's from the second year after Don't Look yeah. Back when Penny went over with Bob and shot his film uh, in color. And, you know, there are things from our, our, our archive. And that's an interesting story in itself because everybody knows about Don't Look Back, but, of course, you... Right. You yeah. then went for the. Well, it was the, the same trip. thing. I mean, we know the arrangement was. Dylan said, "Well, I'm going to. You had your, you had your film. <laughs> now I'm going to direct a film, and and you're going to shoot it for me." And he didn't know anything more about directing than I did. So it was, <laughs> we just continued doing the same damn thing. It was color film. <laughs> and uh, it, it was uh, it was really interesting though because he, he collected a different group of people around him just because he would go on stage. But you can see in that first shot, I wanted to be on stage with him. I was tired of, of, of shooting him from a distance with a long lens. So I made this lens myself. Uh, I got, went and got some glasses, like the old sh uh, uh, captains of ships, they had to make their own lenses for their telescopes. And it, it was very flary, you can see it, but it was a beautiful wide angle. And uh, I loved that lens, I still have it somewhere, but. There's no camera to put it on anymore, so it's kind of useless. <laughs> but, but that second film was, was not released, is that right? Or it's parts never of actually it, been. Parts no. of it are in Martin Scorsese's. Bits of it, and Marty's um, used some of it. No Direction Home. Yeah. yeah. So is, is, that the tool, is that the electric? Is that, that it, the it's waiting to be discovered, let's put it that way. Okay. okay. It, is, it is his electric tour. It is the electric yes. tour, so it is the Judas Cry and all that. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes, well. The, uh, the controversies <laughs> abound about... <laughs> um, um, well, I mean, it, and then of course that begins the whole idea of, of the close musical documentary, 
and that will go on to sort of things like Bowie and, and the Ziggy Stardust, the final Ziggy Stardust uh, performance. And the extraordinary thing about that, of course, was that even you didn't know that that was going to be. No, I, I, I was as surprised as, uh, as everyone in the band was. <laughs> they were flummoxed when he said that. Yeah, so the, you, you turned up to, to film it as part of the ongoing Ziggy Stardust tour or the, yeah. without realizing. Well, I was sent there by RCA uh, to make a film, a little promotional film for a video disc they thought they were going to invent or make. And uh, I was, uh, since they had him already on the payroll, he was considered a, a reasonable choice to do. And uh, I went with just two other, Jim Desmond and, and uh, Nick Dube. Uh, Jim Desmond had been the, well, the ca cameraman uh, on Monterey, so uh, uh, just the three of us, and we, but we always brought our cameras with us wherever we went. And uh, when I saw uh, David in the mirror in his dressing room, I knew instantly we were going to make a film with him, but I didn't quite know how. So I told Jim and Nick, well, we're going to make a film tomorrow night, and... Uh, they said, we are, <laughs> and, and we did. We made, they shot that whole film, the, the three of us. Um, was there a real sense of that something was, <laughs> so to paraphrase it again there, that something was happening there, that, that well, this was Because what, what, what I saw when David got on stage was one person for an hour and a half or however long the show was, two hours, held that stage totally, and nobody ever took their eyes or ears off him. And I thought, That's, there are not many people that can do that in my life. I better get this all on film while it lasts. And then he announced that this was the last show he was ever going to do. And As I Ziggy, thought, it's yeah. a good thing we did this. <laughs> and then he came, he had to come to New York to help me finish it. So we, th there was a, a little place we could get uh, to do a mixing studio, but they, f uh, up till midnight, they were all used up with the people. But from 12 to 5, we could go in and work. So from 12 to 5, for about a month, we worked on the film. And he was a very hard worker. And, uh, and, and we made the film, yeah. Ziggy Stardust. Um, moving on to the, the next film we've, we've got a clip for, which is Town Bloody Hall, which is another. I mean, if, if, if the Dylan films are absolutely encapsulate that sense of, of the 60s, mm -hmm. Town Bloody Hall is, is a debate about women's liberation mm -hmm. that is so much of the era and it's also like a kind of happening in itself, mm -hmm. isn't it? And this, so this was in New York in 1971. Mm -hmm. And on the panel, you have Jermaine Greer in her most splendid, youthful ferociousness, mm -hmm. uh, and Norman Mailer. Um, and you have a selection of other feminist people speaking for and against. Now, this was, it's quite difficult to film something like this where you've got celebrities in the audience, you've got volatile characters up on stage. I mean, how, you know, how can you sense how that's going, and it does kick off as we'll see, but how can you sense where you should be? I don't know, I, I, the, the, the filming in that, uh, I, I, I hesitate to take, take full credit for it, because it, it looks like it was shot on horseback. Uh, <laughs> But Chris made the film, really, so she can talk about it maybe well, more intelligently than I can. Well, cause so Chris, you come later, mm -hmm. um, towards the end of the 70s, and edit mm -hmm. this footage from, uh, and make it into this tremendous document of the time. So, okay, yeah. what was your approach? Yeah, well, I, I came to work with Penny in the mid-70s, and, um, you know, we started this film then, but we didn't release it till the end of the 70s. But, I mean, he, when I met Penny, he brought me into this office where he had an entire wall full of films that he had never edited. And we kind of started going through them one by one. First one was about Robert Kennedy going into schools and singing Christmas carols with you know six of his many children. And then um, he showed me Town Bloody Hall. We sat and watched it. And you know, it was just mesmerizing for me because these women were my heroes. And um, you know, I, I grew up in the... Uh, age of the women's movement beginning, and uh, it was just fascinating. And you know, the event itself was incredible. I mean, it, it's really one for the space capsule. And I always think of it, even though it was shot in '71, as being kind of the last blast happening of the 1960s. And truly, 
anybody who was anybody in New York had to be at this event, and it was billed as the battle of the sexes um, between Norman Mailer and Jermaine Greer, and it was rumored that Jermaine agreed to be on the panel because she wanted to meet Norman Mailer and go to bed with him, um, basically. So it, you know, it had all this around it, and, and several of the very famous uh, feminists, um, Gloria Steinem, Kate Millett, refused to be on the panel because they said, you, you do not debate, debate human rights. And um, you know, they considered that if you were going to debate hum women's rights, um, that you know, this was something they don't want to be involved with. Um, you know, another person who was invited on the panel was um, Jill Johnston, who um, was a journalist uh, for the Village Voice at that point, a very um, popular underground newspaper in New York City, and she was very well known. She was also a dance critic uh, and a famous lesbian. And there was a lot of um, you know, worries about having Jill be on the panel and Betty Friedan, again, probably one of the most famous feminists who wrote some of the early seminal books on, on women um, in the 60s, um, did not want Jill to be there at all. But Jill was just thrilled because she thought that, you know, you know if she's going to be invited into the enemy's camp in a certain way, um, because the women's lib movement it was splintered, as a lot of movements are, and um, you know, Jill was representing a very radical part of it. Um, but so she was, she was thrilled to come at the invitation, and she really wanted to, you know, to do something to disrupt it in, in some way or another. And then, and then you had Norman Mailer, who had written this um, article in Harper's called "The Prisoner of Sex," which um, was also made. In, he, uh, excerpted into a short book, and it was basically Norman talking about women and women's roles and his thoughts on it. And you know, Norman, for somebody who had really, um, you know, brought to the forefront in his writing a lot of the social movements of the you know 50s and 60s, um, he was totally ignorant about the women's movement. He had really no idea what their goals were or what he was up against at all. So it, it ended up being such an interesting, raucous evening for me. And, you know, on top of it had all this strange sexual tension between Norman and Jermaine. Well, let, let's, and let's, she got all this terrible footage to work with. Yeah, and the footage is absolutely <laughs> terrible. I don't know. I think they thought they were shooting a rock concert and were on drugs or something. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but it is such but it's such a wonderfully kind of vivid. You, you really do feel that you're. Anyway, let, let's have a look at the clip, please, of Town Bloody Hall. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrific because it just has, still has such vitality. I mean, that sense of... And, and, and not as an excuse, but one of the reasons the photography was the, the style it was, I think, style, yeah. was that the manager of the theater was trying to throw us out. And that's why <laughs> I got up on the stage, because I figured he wouldn't chase me on the stage. <laughs> but he was chasing after the other two cameras <laughs> as, as fast as he could. So we were all kind of in a state of alarm doing the filming. <laughs> well... I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm going to open it up if anybody has uh, anything that they'd like to contribute or ask about the difficulties of, uh, of filming uh, either close up with musicians or indeed completely unpredictable events like that. Um, there's a hand up right there. Uh, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that seems great, that uh, Town Bloody Hall stuff. Um, and uh, recently I was watching a program where uh, they were talking about Norman Mailer saying that. Um, there's a whole number of writers now who, in those days, uh, were really on the edge and wanted to be the bad, <coughs> the bad boys. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like uh, now, you know, everything's much more managed, uh, much more um, presented in a, in a much more kind of affable way. Do you think it's still possible to make this kind of program now, these days, under the current situation? Is, is everybody just so well-groomed as far as the media are concerned that you wouldn't get that kind of rough... I mean, I think you Hopefully. have this kind of discussion maybe online now mm -hmm. <laughs> in some other kind of forums, yeah. but the, you don't see each other. You're not with each other. And I think what was interesting about this event was that you had all these people. You had this massive intellectual um, writer 
um, community in New York that were there, and they're all arguing about vaginal orgasms and whether you can really have them or not, and just you know these subjects, you know, you know whether women should be paid for housework or you know they ranged all over the place, including you know Norman trying to excuse, you know, beating his wife, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I don't know, it, you know, it certainly was more entertaining than probably a lot of discussions happen in public now, but I think, you know, it was that way because the passions were so raw about those issues. Um, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, definitely now we have some political rallies that are getting, mm. you know, quite so it, it proves to me, though, that if the event was interesting enough or uh, hilarious enough, it didn't matter how badly it was filmed. <laughs> it would always be, it would always prove some kind of entertainment for some future years or something. I mean, I definitely tried when I edited it, um, I just gave up and said, I'm, I'm going to leave all the swish pans and things that I would normally cut out of the film now um, in because it gave you the sense of being there and just how crazy it was. And I think that was important for the event. And actually, in, in terms of including things like the swish pan, sometimes it gives us a chance to catch up with what's going on anyway, you know, the, yeah. in the way that you might. Mm. Uh, sometimes too swift editing mm. can actually destroy your comprehension. Can't yeah. it? I mean, it was very interesting, actually, to show this film to the people in it, because, mm. you know, we didn't finish it until 1979 and release it. So we had them come in, and we had Norman come in, and he kind of walked in, and he said, this is the film that this is the night that Jill Johnston turned my hair gray. And he, by then he had totally white hair. And you know, he was very gracious and he said, I, am, I was so totally clueless, I had no idea mm -hmm. anything about the women's movement at this point. And I was you know, just being outrageous and whatever. It was interesting to hear his response. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, okay, yes, right there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess my question's associated in some way. Um, with public figures nowadays, like for example, the musicians that you've worked with, they have managers and agents and PR people and a whole entourage of folk trying to make sure they're brand X. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that you can still make your film authentic and the film that you want to make instead of you sort of getting access in exchange for being forced to make the film that they and their people want you to make? Hmm. Well, uh, I think the, the filmmaker, uh, if, if he's tagging on the role of an artist, which I think he probably has to consider doing at some difficulty, uh, the artist in him can know no master. And, it, and if he understands that, then he's always free. And you can do anything you want. And it's anything you want is where how you make the film that you, the, in the end, that you want to make. But it's, it's a hard place to get to, I'll tell you. And I, I know from experience, having quit a very good job at Time in Life, where I was happy as, a, as an employed, uh, to where I was unemployed uh, for three years uh, before uh, I got to do a film that, that gave me any kind of income. And I, I knew that when, when Albert Grossman came to see me, about the, doing the film with Dylan, I couldn't have accepted that film had I still been working for a time in life. Not that they might not have wanted it, but I couldn't have accepted it exactly. I would have had to go and get somebody's permission. And it was that difference that gave me, I don't know, the wings <laughs> to fly. It was, it was very simple, but at the time, a little difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting that you should uh, raise that question because the next clip we're going to see is from The War Room, which is the 1993 um, documentary that you made about the Clinton campaign, the very successful Clinton presidential campaign, which introduced us to a, a figure or a type of figure we were at the time unfamiliar with but now know only too well, which is the person who manages the campaign, who kind of looks after the image of the politician. Um, so you, ha you have these two characters, James Carville, um, and uh, George Stephanopoulos, who was director of communications. Now, that idea of the person who manages the politician and the person who directs the communications, that is so central to political life now. I mean, I guess it always was, but 
Mm -hmm. Your film made it that explicit, didn't yeah. it? It made everybody have to have a war room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sadly, I think James came over and advised Tony Blair on his war room. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> and, but, but at the point, because I've always wondered about James Carville, it, as we'll see in the clip, such an extraordinary character. Mm -hmm. Was he like, did he start to play up for the cameras or was he always like that? I mean, James was always on. I mean, that's the type of person he was. So having a war room was perfect for him because he could always turn around and just, you know, go on to one person who would usually be ignoring him and you know, <laughs> go, go to somebody else. Um, but um, actually, I mean, he wanted to have an open place where everybody could pass their ideas freely and it didn't have the type of hierarchy that was in campaigns in the past. And he asked Hillary, actually, if uh, he could create this type of situation in the campaign. And she said, yes, but you have to call it the war room because we don't want the Republicans to think we're some kind of wishy-washy Democrats. Huh. So, um, yeah, so Hillary actually named it. But it was perfect for James. And, you know, he's, he's a great character. I mean, I always say if I could have James and Bob Dylan in every film, I'd be all set. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's see the clip, please, from the war room. So obviously you, you, you were there, whatever the outcome, anyway. I mean, was there ever a point at which they said, okay, enough, we don't, or they, were, they just allowed you complete access? We lived with them. You lived with them? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, actually, we didn't get access, which in some ways is why we called it the war room, because we, didn't, we really wanted to make a film about a man becoming president and really watch the candidate, oh. watch Clinton. And, you know, in the end, Clinton had a news reporter and a photographer that were already following him around. And so they decided, you know, to have a, like a couple documentary team following him, you know, was just going to be too much. So we had access, but very little access to Clinton. And so uh, basically, um, you know, George said, because he was communications director, he said, well, you know, if you want, you can hang around with the campaign staff. And, you know, it was a little bit like the booby prize or something, you know, because you, if Clinton lost, you'd have a film about the, you know, losing staff of the losing candidate, which <laughs> was not going to be that saleable. But, um, you know, in the process, we stumbled across James Carville. And, you know, it, we, we, you know we thought he was somebody's drunken um, uncle or something that was, like, <laughs> hanging around the campaign. But he ended up being the director of strategy. And brilliant, too. And, you know, he and George were kind of like buddies in a sense and kind of worked off each other. And we felt that, you know, if we hung around them, um, you know, we could get something that other people didn't get, especially in the war room, which you don't really see in this <laughs> selection. But and, and in a sense that the, the, the Carville Stephanopoulos, they, they were the alternative ticket, weren't they? I mean, so and you get them, you get much more from them than you would ever get from a sort of pasteurized politician. So it makes a much better viewing and indeed the American Academy recognized that as well. With it, I know. And you know, when we met, we went back to make a film uh, yeah. uh, two elections later or whenever it was. Um, <laughs> many years later. Many years later. Twelve years later. It was long ago, long ago afterwards. Yes. But uh, it, what was really fascinating, of course, was the, the old, they used to use, uh, they used to send letters to each other by fa fax, right? Which took time. Now they had these little things they held to their ear. But... The thing that was amazing <laughs> was that George and James, uh, the guy that did their polling, uh, Rem, Rom, Rom, Rom Emanuel, Emanuel mm -hmm. every morning, today, every morning, they call each other on the phone mm. and talk. I think that's so incredible. They're like soulmates forever. So they keep having all the sort of soundings about the way things are going. Yeah, well, and, and between you, you making those films and, and the political situation as it is now mm -hmm. in the States, I mean, presumably, I imagine that all the campaigns have sort of embedded documentary makers with them who have a sort of, you know, a part you of the so, establishment. think so, don't you? You, it, it, yeah. you? you should. I mean, they do. What happens to the films is uncertain. Because yeah, but they, but they won't be sort of independent in the way that you were independent. I imagine they now kind of use it for you know, their own publicity and propaganda purposes, do they? I, d I don't know. It's I guess, I don't know. I mean, I know a few people that are making films around the campaigns, but I don't know 
of the filmmakers, somebody else here might, mm -hmm. um, that are embedded in... Yeah. Because it becomes okay. quite a, a mysterious air, area sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, as you said, you have that, that genuine in independence, but yeah. there's an awful lot of stuff out there that isn't yeah. independent. I mean, when we went back and did this film, it was called The Return of the War Room, and it's <clears throat> a second disc on uh, our Criterion release. Um, I mean, originally I went back because um, somebody asked us to do something on uh, the election then and go back uh, to people in the war room. Um, but I was very interested in James Carville and Mary Matlin's relationship because, I don't know if you know here, but James Carville's girlfriend was George Bush's director of uh, strategy. It was the yeah. basically you couldn't the have made it up. Unbelievable. Yeah. It was so Shakespearean. But, uh, <laughs> and they weren't allowed to talk to each other really during the campaign, but they talked a little bit. And um, it, it just was a fascinating, weird situa situation to have. And I was just always interested in you know, their personal relationship because eventually they got married. And when we went to film them, they you know, were married and they had two children. And, and everything else, and you know, it was very strange. But um, a lot of it was, you know, what changed between then and this election. And we went back to everyone, including uh, the Perot campaign, which was interesting because, I mean, there was a lot of talk in our American election about somebody being a third party candidate and emerging as that. That seems to have gone away, but that was a really big deal in the um, 1992 election as well, but also just the old-fashioned way they had to do everything. I mean, what they thought was state-of-the-art was like going on college radio, or, or they had a few kind of satellite bouncing of things, but, you know, it was having advanced teams and being able to strike back really fast. And George, when he was talking about it, and he was now working for ABC television, um, he said he probably, you know, wouldn't do a campaign. He wouldn't know how to deal with the fact that you have all these cameras everywhere taking pictures and everybody has to be so guarded um, and the Im information is traveling at a you know an unbelievable speed in one second it's it's news so um, campaigns are so different so this is a dinosaur era basically in campaigning <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to uh, chip in on that on that idea of the political campaign film so I can see you now Any anybody know? Who's embedded? Yeah, They're who's still embedded? Here. They hadn't left yet. <laughs> right at the top here. Uh, thank you very much. I get, the obvious example, I guess, is, is Wiener, and, and, and I, I wonder if you two have seen it. I, I yes. also wonder what your thoughts are on the, the moment when, in the car, um, Wiener says to the director, who has just asked him a leading question, um, uh, I thought the point about fly on the wall films was, you're a fly on the wall. I, <laughs> I never heard a fly talk. You know? and I, yes. um, I think it was beautifully mm -hmm. done, and it, it's a variation on your uh, style. Uh, and, 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 and I thought actually the director's you know, involvement was y useful in a sort of Brechtian way in terms of giving us, um, uh, gi 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 giving us a enabling us to take a step back. I, 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 want, I just wonder how, how, well, what you thought of Wiener. Well, jo Josh was our student at <laughs> Yale, so <laughs> he already came up to me and blamed you know, his film on the war room. And, <laughs> our, and, and yeah, and we, we know Josh. And you know, he was always um, teetering between politics and, and film. And I remember at one point I wrote him about five recommendations to go to film school, and then in the end he went and worked for Wiener. And, um, you know, it seemed to be the better choice, <laughs> I'd say. It's, it's a fantastic film. Yeah, that's worked really well. Great. Well, the, the next um, clip that we're moving towards is very different, which is Kings of Pastry. And this is an observational film about an extraordinary competition, which is probably the most prestigious in the patisserie world, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is uh, French chefs getting together to create confections beyond our wildest imaginings. Now, how on earth did you get involved in that? Uh, well, we got involved in it in the way that we do all our films, is that somebody, um, well, somebody really came to, come to us about it. A friend of mine um, 
decided she was going to go. She moved back from New York to Chicago, and she decided to go to the French pastry She was taking school. her dog, too. Don't forget about the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> we know her because of our dogs. Almost the dogs all of our were films squeezes. come out of our dog Our dogs friends. and her dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the dog connect. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so she was going back to the school, and um, she told me that one of the heads of the school was going to compete in this very prestigious contest where... Um, in the end, it's like the Olympics in a, in a certain way. The winner gets to wear this tricolor collar on his chef jacket for the rest of his life. And the contest, the Mayor Aubry de France, was created at the turn of the century to make sure that all the type of artists and crafts that are so beloved and famous in France, um, and they're everything from cheese and woodworking to pastry and other culinary um, occupations, that they remain at a very high level because the Industrial Revolution was kind of slowly eroding a lot of the quality that was happening in these things. And for some reason, the pastry competition is one of the hardest competition. It goes on for three days, and even the, you know, the, the normal cooking contest is only two days, so, and they had to compete in a two-day contest just like this in order to be able to compete in this three-day contest, and it's incredibly expensive for, peop for chefs to do this, and they spend their entire lives, you know, practicing for an event like this to, to get this special distinction, and, you know, Jackie Pfeiffer, who is the chef that we followed from Chicago, uh, in the contest, um, I mean, we, we met, went out and met him, and I remember there's always like a point when you're filming somebody in the beginning that you decide it's a film, and you know, we went out kind of the first day, and I filmed him at this little place we were eating lunch, and he, he started telling me the story how every night um, he has these nightmares that he's going to break something in his um, in the contest, and his wife has to wake him up every night, you know, to make sure he doesn't have this nightmare and this whole thing. I thought, this person is so stressed out and, you know, the, the risk for him is so enormous that, you know, there's definitely a story here. That's the second time I've seen that and it's just as unbearable the second time. <laughs> it was pretty unbearable in the camera lens too, I have to say. Actually, I didn't know if I actually got the shot because the chef in front of him had such a tall hat on and he kind of like bends over. So, and I was kind of looking at the screen, the, the viewfinder in one eye and I had the other eye open, so I wasn't really sure. And I, I was filming with tape at that point. I remember after a lot of the commotion ended, I went back and rolled the reel back to see if it was actually there because it was such a astonishing moment where it just went. It's when he goes to the window, I think, and there's just the sort of, where can he put all that? Oh, terrible. And, and then there must be moments in, in all sorts of, the, where you feel, is, is there ever a moment where you think maybe I, I shouldn't be filming this? Or, or is, it, is that not even a consideration? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, not particularly that case, but you know, mm -hmm. other things. Well, we weren't allowed in until the day before the thing began. Okay. So we were, we, floating on a bar bard of hope. <laughs> <laughs> if we hadn't get in, gotten in, there'd been no film. No. And nobody had ever been allowed even to go in before to watch it. So it was, uh, luckily we had some very handsome ladies f from, from our New York friends who went and persuaded them. Because they spoke French and I don't. <laughs> But, but also, I love the way that's edited because the, with the music and it has that kind of jaunty feeling. So, so you're not really, ex you know there's, there's some jeopardy, but you're not expecting that. And, and you can tell from everybody's yeah. reaction. Though. Penny, she asked if, if um, there were any cases where you felt you shouldn't film. In that film? No, in any of your In any film? In any of your films. Uh, maybe, I just don't remember them. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I mean, I never was asked to film anything really salacious or pornographic, particularly. Uh, but if it had come up, I probably would have filmed it. I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't there to, to uh, I wasn't there to make a movie exactly. I was there to watch what people did when they're 
when their blinds were down, you know. And, and then later I had to sit down and make a movie out of it when you edit it. But when you're shooting it, you're just companioning people and you're kind of making a home movie and they know that. So when they, for instance, I think in the, in the war room, it would have been hard to make a film about Clinton because he couldn't really afford to have a home movie made when, when the six o'clock news was waiting. So you'd always be kind of put aside or, or you'd gotten front porch talk. You would never have gotten really, at the, but with James and George, they told us everything. So I, I realized by luck we had fallen the one place you could make a, a film. But I, I, people say, well, you, you, you've made a political film. I never think of it as a political film because I don't know anything about politics particularly as a result of it, or I just know two people who do it. But what I do know is uh, two people who are companions, like buddies, can do a lot where one person can't. I think um, actually in this Kings of Pastry film, pretty soon after that moment where Philippe's um, sculpture cr crashes on the floor and you know, I kept filming and each of the chefs had like a, 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 a monitoring chef that could help them or you know, watch over and the monitoring chef happened to be our, our other character, Jackie Pfeiffer from Chicago's uh, partner in his school who had the collar and his, he was to monitor Philippe whose sculpture broke and I remember he came up to me and told me to stop filming because he didn't want me to be making him nervous although we were only allowed because they were so worried the day that they would be carrying these sculptures around that we would bump into somebody and they said if you bump into somebody and make their sculpture fall they will kill you. I mean, that was basically it. So we're going to put like a little square this big at the end of each of the long tables and that's where you can stand. You have to stay in that little box so you know I wasn't standing close to him to make him nervous or anything but he still didn't want me to film and you know, eventually, I mean, that's my job as a filmmaker is to make the story and film. So eventually, I did have to start filming again. And, and I think quite often, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of filmmakers here have that situation where, you know, when things aren't going so well, people don't want you around and don't want you to be filming. And you have to respect that and somehow, you know, wedge your way back into their lives and, and start it again. But we did, we started a film with Al Sharpton when Al was going to run for president. And uh, we shot for maybe half a year or six months or more. Nice. And uh, I really liked him. I, I used, he had a church up on 125th Street. And uh, I'm not a very religious person. I'm a Quaker, really. But I could sit in his church and be totally convinced that what he was telling me was, was, was right and I should change my life. And so it was, it was kind of a fascinating film as far as we got. And then it became apparent that uh, a, a woman was helping him. Her brother was also filming him. And uh, I think he was having a romance with her. Things were going on in his life that I think he was not happy to have his film. And we had to uh, bail. Mm -hmm. and, and that was sort of too bad because I kind of liked him and I liked the film. But y y you knew that you weren't wanted. You can't make a film. Yeah. No matter what you think you can, you can't. Well, uh, in this last section, we're, we're going to move on to, to your new film, um, which is showing this evening, I believe, mm. and uh, which is called Unlocking the Cage, and is about a very... Uh, I mean, it, it's a film that's quite difficult to describe in a headline, because if you do, it sounds a lot simpler than, in fact, it is, which, but it is about a legal case to demonstrate that an animal can be regarded as a person, really. Um, and... So it brings up all sorts of things about animal rights. But this was, this was something because you were interested in the whole area of this? Or, I mean, why particular of all the things you, you could have gone, did you go to this? Um, well, we were looking for a new project, and um, you were kind of mourning our dog. We had this huge dog that got us into Kings of Pastry, as well as Startup.com and yeah. some <laughs> other films, um, had died. And... Um, we were sitting in our office, and then a friend brought in um, Stephen Wise, who's the animal rights lawyer in our film, and uh, it, it, it kind of seemed somewhat zen to do a film about animal rights. I mean, 
We loved animals. We knew nothing about animal rights and very little about the law. And you know, he walked in and said that for the past 30 years, he was trying to protect animals uh, in some ways. And he was actually doing a lot of arguing in courts for bad dogs, as Penny yeah. says. Dogs that had you know, bit their neighbor or done something bad. And, and uh, you know, he had had a lot of success in the way that he argued those cases. But it was like one dog at a time. And, and you know, the problem was, was huge. So um, he decided that the only way to do something more than the type of protections that they could get from statutes and welfare laws was to argue that an animal was a legal person and had the right not to be killed or some right that was appropriate to protecting them and that he was going to go into a court and do that specifically uh, for an animal that had been heavily studied to have um, very high cognitive capabilities, like an elephant or a great ape or a whale or dolphin. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it sounded novel, it sounded intriguing, and, you know, we just started, mm -hmm. like all of our films. And, you know, again, I had a kind of moment when I was filming Steve. He was going up to a class in Harvard that he was teaching, um, and you know, he was telling me that, you know, when he first started 30 years ago, he would walk into a, a courtroom and people would bark at him. Mm. And, you know, now, you know, things were changing. That's our regular thing, isn't it? It's our trailer. <laughs> our trailer, right. Okay. And, that, and, and the fact that last, those last few words, it's time to begin, it's, it's that idea that over the years, you have time and time again picked subjects that seem to be the beginning of something. I mean, is that, is, that some, is that something you can feel intuitively? Well, I think everybody is drawn to futurizing in, in some way. And for me, that's what it was. I, I feel, uh, I mean, I, I've, got, I've got a long, many years behind me. And I, there, I, my sense is that there's a change taking part not just in, the, in my culture, but in the world. Uh, and I think it's beyond just not eating meat, which I think in 20 years, nobody will eat meat anymore. It's just an expense we can't afford. But I think it has to do with, with a new kind of regard or uh, alliance with animals and the need to somehow communicate with them because I think that they know things that we need to know and we've never thought about it before. They just served us wherever we needed service. And I think that that is a new world that's changing and that this film kind of has a spark of that. And that always intrigues me. Go ahead. I'm going to open it up the last <coughs> few moments to, um, for the audience. Do we have some lights, please? Yes, hand right there. I'm sorry, I'm conscious. And one up there as well. I want, uh, I want to ask something uh, about uh, the previous uh, years. Uh, the, uh, following the life, uh, watching life with your camera oh. uh, di for direct cinema, was it uh, more difficult uh, with the equipment you have in 60s and 70s? I mean, with the film and you needed more light and you know, it's more easy today. Easier with the lighter technology, the more sort of sensitive Light sensitive. First of all, let me introduce the person who photographed that film, uh, <laughs> and and she did such a fan. I mean, after I saw the shot when the when when our guy's thing fell, mm -hmm. and she first looked at the floor where all the stuff was, I thought uh, 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 she's the cameraman now, <laughs> not me, and and it's been that way ever since. And I'm really I'm so proud of her because she does such a fantastic job, that, and she's never trained herself as a photographer particularly, but this kind of filming trains you to watch things, and which is what I think good photography probably should be. But do you think it is easier now for documentary makers with the technology than, say, back in the 60s when you yeah. had, uh, yeah? Well, it's the, we got a pencil now. Uh, yeah. yeah. Look, you, you, you know, everybody's got one of these, Yeah. and I think films will all be made this way mm -hmm. in, in, within a very few years. And, and why not? They already are. You know, <laughs> you wanna, I think that filming is, is a kind of way of seeing what you don't normally see in your life. 
the, the rest of the world. And I think that that's what, uh, th that's what people will be talking about since we have, have jumped from being a, a narrow culture and a narrow place to live into a, a world economy. And it's, uh, I mean, I just hear all what's going on now about what, sh should we join the EU, stay with the EU, EU or leave it? These are the subjects that never would have come up 50 years ago. And it's kind of interesting that the way you find out is you, you talk to people by phone. <laughs> um, I guess along those lines, for both of you as observers and watchers uh, over the past few decades, are you uh, optimistic about the future outside of filmmaking, just in terms of your own perspectives of the world? Ooh, there's a big question. <laughs> I don't know. You know I mean, you're always uplifted and downlifted at the same time. It's hard to... No, I, but I think there are enough people always that I meet who are of good intention and basically have a kind of grace in the way they live that I think it, it can't go bad all at once. But it certainly can get desperate from time to time, and I think that that's what we have to somehow survive as those desperate moments. But I, 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 I yeah, I'm, I'm sort of hopeful. I mean, I'm very hopeful. Uh, <laughs> and, and anybody, I'm, I'm hopeful of anybody that has a dog as currently can't be all bad. <laughs> Penny's so hopeful, he thinks uh, Hillary's gonna win. <laughs> well, somebody once told me that Hitler had a dog and right away I started to like him. So you can see. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, that, that is the other, but, but you should say he's, you're so optimistic you think Hillary's going to win. What if she doesn't? Yeah. We're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, there's that, there was a hand somewhere in there, was it? There it is. Yeah. Uh, hello, yes, I haven't seen Unlocking the Cage, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing it, but I sense from what you've said just now that you have a particular empathy and a personal sense of... Um, of how animals ought to be treated and so on. So I'm wondering whether that personal politic comes through in the film or whether you felt you needed to manage that and if so, how you trod that path. Um, well, my personal politics, as I said before, was totally ignorant. I mean, I didn't come into it uh, how I came out of it. And I think, you know, in some of our films, I always learn something from making a film and especially from our characters and a lot of their bravery. Um, and definitely that's the case with this. But I, th I think it also changed how I look at animals and think of the world. I mean, I, I remember four years ago when Steve came and told us what he was going to do, I went, well, what about zoos? And now it kind of it seems inconceivable that you would keep any of these animals that he's arguing for in a zoo. And, you know, I've had so many changes, you know, between my diet and, you know, how I want to help animals and uh, that it, it, the film was a life-changing experience through the way. But, I, you know, so I didn't really have any pol politic to put on it in the beginning when I was making it. It, it more you know, changed we, we, me. We, we never research any film. The film is the research. Mm. We don't even have yellow pads around the office. Uh, no notes. Y you learn from making the film, and that's what, that's what I learned from Flaherty. That's how you learn anything, is by making a film of, uh, of what hap you find in it. And, and that's enough. Uh, that's, that's, that's research beyond anything you can do any elsewise. Mm. Mm. OK, there was a hand. Just there. I think we've probably got time for one more. It's here. Here we are. Here we are. So um, I'm left with a bit more of the fun question, actually, because I, th I think the first one was about how you learn and the political influence yeah. of your filming. Um, are there any subjects? matters that you've really been keen on making a documentary that you've failed to sort of produce the documentary or not been able to gain the uh, access to the material or anything? Ones that got away. Are there any ones that got away that you really would have liked to have done? Well, I mean, Penny mentioned the one on Al Sharpton, which was, you know, we were pretty, you know, 
involved in the subject um, and really wanted to make that film. Um, so that one got away. I mean, there's a lot of them that get away. I mean, in some ways, I just kind of then put them out of my mind <laughs> and don't think about them anymore, and something else happens that was meant to be. I mean, you have to kind of just think in that way because you can't do anything about the ones that you couldn't What about do. musicians in, with the musical angle? Mm -hmm. Any musicians that got away or that you really wanted to do, Penny? Well, the music, I, music people, the musicians that I would love to have made films with, unfortunately perished before, before I was even able to hold a camera. I mean, Bix Beiderbeck for me would have been the perfect subject for this kind of film because he, he was the god of music for almost every musician I've ever known. He couldn't read music and he didn't know how to play the cornet. He did played it with the wrong fingering. And still, he was the god of, of the cornet for, for everyone in Chicago where music was exploding because of Louis Armstrong and, and, uh, and, 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 and the musicians were, were coming in from the south to, to play in the gangsters clubs. So as, as kids, we, we knew what they sounded like because we could buy this 78 record which had exploded music everywhere. Everybody knew who Fats Waller was suddenly. Whereas before that, you had to go to a, a dark, smelly little bar and, and maybe hear him play. Suddenly, everybody knew jazz music in Chicago. And it spread out like wildfire. And that, for me, was such a, an amazing experience. And I had a friend who was a piano player who became a really a, a, a professional and played with big bands and was really good. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to play the piano or the trumpet or something. I want to be a musician because they were kind of gods for me. They were people that abandoned every, all the, 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 the nonsense of life and lived only to do what they thought they did best and, 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 and which was music. And I thought, that's, that's, that, those are saints. You know, we have to pay attention to them because they know something that everybody else has forgotten. And I, those, those are the films I would... But I wasn't thinking about films when I knew those things. I just listened to my 78 records and, uh, and played them. But I, I think that, the, that even today, there... And I'm not sure music is the same for everybody that it was for me then or something else is, but I think your instincts to survive in our cultures is, first of all, how am I gonna make a living? How am I gonna pay my rent? How am I gonna raise my children? But there's also, why am I here? And people have to answer that. And that's a big question and a hard one, but that's the only question that it matters. <coughs> Well, on that note, that's the perfect, a perfect note on which to end. Thank you for your questions. And you. Penny and Chris, thank you both very much. Thank you, Francine. Yeah, thank you. That's great.